go. All right. Good morning, everybody. Ready to hold a Board of County Commissioners meeting in Montezuma County. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, planning. Oops. Come on up. We got to do our meeting. What about our minutes? Minutes. Oh, yeah, it's we ought to do there. that, huh? It's not, it's not on there, but we got Yeah, you put it on my list. <laughs> All right, let's do the minutes. Do you have any? I don't have anything. Okay, I don't either. And Jim's not with us today. I move to approve the proceedings of Board of County Commissioners of Montezuma County for Tuesday, February 28th, 2023, as presented. Second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. There we go. Yes, ma'am. Oh. I was just so you didn't have to stretch. <laughs> okay, planning. Thank you. Short and sweet today. All we have is a mylar to sign on a previously approved subdivision. I can reach you. <laughs> Anything else? That's all we got for today, unless you got something to discuss. So we plan anything unplanned? I mean, not anything too definitive yet. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. All right. We'll go into the public comment session. The Board of Montezuma County Commissioners welcome, welcomes you to this meeting. Persons speaking during public comment will be limited to three minutes or depending on the number of people wishing to speak. It may be reduced to allow all members of the public the opportunity opportunity to address the board when addressing the board please state your name and address for the record prior to providing your comments comments to individual supervisors or staff are not permitted participants may not yield their time to others we have any public comment this morning come on up morning uh, make sure your mic's on, please. There it is. You guys hear me? There we go. Yeah. Good morning. 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 My name is Bill Blackford. Uh, I currently live at 712 Canyon Drive. Um, wanted to come and introduce myself. I'm the new general manager for Farmers Telephone and Farmers Telecommunications. 
and wanted to just take a quick minute just to introduce myself. Um, I'm a, uh, I was actually born in Colorado, um, but I've lived most of my life in southwest Montana in a rural area. I've spent about 20 years in the telecommunications industry, um, and I currently um, moved here and took the position here about a couple months ago. Um, so I just wanted to come and introduce myself, um, kind of tell you a little bit about who I am. Our plans are to try to make this our forever home. We love this area and love the rural environment and the very, um, just a very special community. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. And I moved here with my wife and beautiful uh, wife and daughters and grandson. Um, and I do have a, a son in the United States Air Force as well. Uh, really the reason why I wanted to come here was uh, based on the past actions of the previous general manager. Um, and really wanted to express to this commission that in no way does the past behavior actions of the previous general manager um, reflect on the spirit or the character of our board, employees, or our customers, and really wanted to express to you that as I look forward to where Farmers is going, we're committed to transparency. Um, we're uh, committed to accountability, teamwork, and collaboration. Uh, one of the things that uh, we got Rodney here sitting in the back, you guys might know Rodney. Um, I'm having uh, the managers of the business really help run the company um, and really work as a team. Um, and cr try to create better transparencies as I know that that was an issue in the past. And I wanted to let the commission know that, you know, we're really committed to the customers, partnerships, and the government entities, and we want to treat everybody with respect and dignity. So wanted to just say thank you um, for your time today. I look forward to meeting many of you in the coming days, months, and years. And uh, that's all I had. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome Absolutely. to our community, and hope you have a lot of success. Thank you. you will. Appreciate it, Commissioner. And to your son, thank him for his service. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, hearing none, seeing none, we'll move on to our department reports. Rob? Road and Bridge. Morning, Rob. Morning. I appreciate Don and his quick meeting this morning. That was very refreshing. <laughs> For the record. <laughs> All right. Um, welcome to March. Looks like we've got um, pretty much a lot of snow removal continuing through this week. Uh, we're still out pushing back. Um, we are in the middle of a little bit of a break here, thank goodness. But Loved the snow, but it was time to let us catch up a little bit here, too. So we are doing that this week. And along with that, we're doing some mowing down McCamel Canyon. We're still coming up out of the canyon, doing uh, right-of-way mowing down through there as we come up through the middle of the month. And then towards the end of the month, it's time to start cleaning culverts. Uh, I think rain is forecast for the next few days in front of us, which is going to accelerate that. And there's a lot of culverts that are plugged up, and we know they are because we started out pushing mud off the road and then never really got any frost and so then we pushed some more mud off the road and never got any more frost and so <laughs> I think we've got a lot of culverts so we're going to be cleaning out and then irrigation season will be upon us before you know it and that always adds uh, a lot of water to the ditches too so that'll be a big push this year we brought that up we talked about it quite a bit in our monthly mass safety meeting this month uh, getting prepared for that and that's that's going to be more prevalent this year than probably the last several years so also potholes. I know there's probably some potholes out there that are starting to come to surface and there'll be more as it thaws out and uh, gets uh, dried out a little more. We obviously will jump into the middle of those two and uh, get started on those. So um, uh, right away, uh, we'll finish mowing that out towards the end of the month down in McCamel. That's coming along well. Uh, but then uh, we've got lots of trees to go mow up in the upper higher country as the snow recedes back and we can get into those ditches too. So we got plenty of work for the spring and the spring activity start. The other issue that I was out driving around with one of the foreman yesterday is the, the mag chloride on these county gravel roads are starting to pothole out, which is normal with the water. And there's not a lot we can do about it until we get dry enough on the edges that we can actually blade the roads. So there's a fine line between go rub out the potholes and uh, they just come right back to actually pull the ditches and bring the gravel up and reshape the crowns and do it right. So. We'll do the best we can and just ask everybody to be patient with us. We know they're there and uh, we'll get on with us just as quick as it makes sense. <coughs> so, 
So that's about what we're doing in March. Um, any questions on any of that? Uh, gravel crushing. Yes, sir. By the looks of roads, driveways, and everything else, we're going to need quite a bit of gravel. We're going to be able to keep up. Yeah, I think so. We're full at Hay Camp, and we're moving down to uh, Macalmo, setting up this week. We had about a two-week delay there. We, we used part of that crusher crew to do snow removal, so we had to go do that. But uh, the, the plant is down at Macalmo, and we're setting it up this week and getting ready to go. And uh, we'll be crushing chips and gravel down there for both. Uh, but we're full at Mancus, or well, pretty full, and then we're full at Hay Camp. So I think we're stockpiled up pretty well. Okay. We've also got quite a bit stockpiled in each one of the yards, Dolores, Cortez, and Mancus, and all that. So uh, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. Good. Good. Okay, uh, next bit of news would be that as our chart for the wells down in Macamo, uh, highlighted in yellow, the last time we measured those was July 25th or basically the 1st of August of 2022. And you can see the numbers across there, left to right is 14.28, so forth across. And then blue was just last week. We went down and got them measured again, and we're seeing very little to no significant change, which is excellent. So... Uh, talking to the engineering group, uh, we think we made the right choice now, obviously, by putting that pipeline in down there and going around the slide area with, by enclosing that ditch and not letting it leak anymore. But we are really kind of nice to have this, replicating what happened in 2019 when we had that big winter, all that water spring thaw. Hmm. Yep. And we hope to see if it's going to change, these wells will tell us if we're starting to get an abundance of groundwater or spring water again like we did in 2019. So as we move into March, it's the same time frame that we had last time when we started having that slide. Right now, everything is very stable down there. It's holding. Nothing's moving. There's no new movement. So uh, we're crossing our fingers that we can get started on that this spring uh, after it thaws out a little bit and dries out a little bit in there and uh, not have any more movement on that uh, slide. So it's holding good for now. Uh, the next sheet there is just a graph that shows the data that I just went over. You can see how they dropped since back in Oh, what was that? I don't know what year it was now. Forget, but it was six minus six minus six inches or six feet on the wells there, basically. And you can see a steady decrease all the way out to current now uh, of February, and and it's just holding steady for us. So it's 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 done its job. That's went through a spring, a, an irrigation season or two now, and another spring coming on that we're holding steady. So we feel very comfortable that. The work we put in down there so far has stabilized that thing. So that's good news. So, All right. Uh, back to snow removal. Um, just so everybody's kind of aware of it, we've had a good winter. We've had a lot of help from the community. We've had a few questions about what ifs and could ofs. But just as a reminder, and that's all this is about, is nothing more than a reminder. Uh, mailboxes and driveways was probably the most phone calls, um, obviously, you know. Uh, <laughs> but there is a resolution back in uh, 2008, uh, signed by the commissioners at that time to um, answer those questions. So that goes out to the public when, when it's needed. Uh, if you want to read through that, it's your convenience. Uh, the other one is the Colorado CDOT, snow, how to plow snow out of your driveway. This has probably been one of our handiest tools. We put these out to the individuals that want to know more about it. It basically tells you how to get the snow out of your driveway and keep it off the roadways. Uh, where not to put the snow, obviously. Scroll down a little bit there, Travis. Like, don't put it out in the road. Um, there's a reason for that. It's not us. It's not the county. The county can push it off the road when we get back to it, but it might be tomorrow before we get there. So what happens is that lays out there and it freezes at night. Now it becomes a tremendous hazard to the traveling public and a liability and a potential fine, and the law gets involved in it and a lot of headache. So... Uh, if they'll take it to your right, that's better because as we come by, we plow to the right and we shove it on down the road and push it back in the ditch instead of back in your driveways. If you take it to the left, if you think about it, we're just going to take that pile of snow and put it right back in your driveway. So there's some common sense to all this too. So, And then the second sheet on that, that kind of shows that. It's laying the wrong direction, but you can see the point a little more there, Travis. Push it away from the road and then take it to the right. That's what they're trying to de depict and uh, that's how that works. And CDOT lives by this general common sense rule, just like we do. So and then the last page is the legal ramifications of it all, the state statutes and the fines and the penalties that can come from it, because it is illegal, you know. Yeah. If you want to visit from a state patrolman, try that on a state highway. They will be happy to visit with you. So. <laughs> 
Uh, the last thing, or the, the one, the one, no, the second, the third sheet I've got is a letter. Uh, when when this doesn't work, then we do write a letter. It comes from the from the road department. It's a letter that's uh, basically a boilerplate telling you what state statute is and what the law can do and what can say. And that's the last resort. If we have that kind of problems, we we usually don't want to send this letter, but it is a tool. So. And then last thing I got for that is the. Um, private snow removal list. Uh, we put this together and then we actually got some help from uh, Ron Higman uh, with some information that they have with the seniors out there to help them, which is wonderful. Uh, we put this out as a list of potentials. We don't recommend any of them or we don't deny any of them. We just say this is some people out there that do this for a living and uh, call one of them. They're all good in my opinion. They've all been very responsive. They've all been very friendly with the public that I know of and it's worked well. So, and they're all good, good people. So that's what we've been doing all winter. And just to kind of remind everybody that uh, we try our best not to mess you up, but that snow's got to go somewhere. So that's, that's kind of the way it works. So fences, um, there's a letter we put out for people that uh, have a fence that's right on the edge of the road. And if the damage is there, it's sorry, it's there. You've got staples next spring, stretch your wire and put it back, you know. If you're out at the easement line, 60 foot or 30 foot from the center, then we'll be very responsive in the spring to come help, you know. that's We don't want to push it that far either, so. Yeah. Uh, we've had a few issues like that. Um, some people say that's grandfathered in. No, it's not. You, you chose to put it there 50 years ago and it's still wrong. Two wrongs don't make a right. So when they put a new fence in, it's the same rules. So we've been getting through that with just some good communication, you know, so. That's, that's been working. So, Cemetery fences? Cemetery fences, same way. <laughs> but in, in retrospect, we plow your parking lots there, so you do get something out of it. So, <laughs> you know. um, so that's the snow season. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy that it's going to rain. I, I'm ready for a little bit of relief. Let's go clean some culverts now and let's move on. You know? so it's, muddy. it's been a wonderful winter, and I'm not complaining. And I talked to a CDOT guy the other day, and he started to say it, and I, I just said quietly, I said, shh, you're not supposed to talk like that. So let's, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's nice. It's been a long winter. We put a lot of overtime in this year. So You guys really did a good job. Thank you. We, a lot, we, of, yeah. lot of good compliments out there, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to say who it was, but I had one yesterday with a fellow – kid I grew up with out at Lewis and he said I never had this problem you lived here your whole life I said they didn't plow the roads when I was a kid we stacked on top of it and drove on it so yeah. <laughs> it's a whole different world out there now you know so yeah, yeah. and he agreed he had to, he had to be reminded of that but he did agree yeah. so pretty tough to pull your grandkids behind your pickup on a sled it, now. it don't work anymore <laughs> 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 I look at those favorite hills now and they're all gravel you know, know. So. <laughs> yep yeah. so times change so um that's about all I had this this week. Uh, we're, we're equipment's doing pretty well. We got we had a lot of time spent on snow plows rebuilding them, and uh, hopefully we're back to being okay. We're getting ready to start doing DOTs on the um, end dumps. The belly dumps are ready to roll. Uh, the water trucks will be coming in because as, as thing starts rolling over quick, and it'll be get the water trucks out and let's get started on blading these roads and and get going on that. So I think we're back in a routine here that uh, next month you'll probably see a lot more of this work start developing, you know, uh, hauling and different things. So, so any questions? Nope. Good. Gerald? Out here on road, and I haven't looked at it yet. A guy called me about it the other day on L Road mm -hmm. between 25 and the highway. They're going across. <clears throat> Evidently, there's a couple of markers there or something I didn't exactly understand what he was talking about, but it was Gerald Colley. You know oh, where Gerald is? yes. Uh -huh. Okay. I don't know. Has he talked to you about that? No. Okay. Evidently, there's a couple of markers that are just so far apart. It almost looks at night when you go by it, it looks like a driveway, and he's afraid somebody was going to. Oh, I know what you're talking about, Gerald. I, I had. Uh, and I don't know what. I, I well, haven't looked at it. What that is, is that's where that big culvert crosses. What, what yeah, that's that? what he was saying. Right. That there was a big culvert there. And he was afraid somebody was going to turn in there thinking that was a driveway. I, I don't know. I haven't well, looked at it. He, I, it's just, I guess you could look at it that way, sir. Uh, I had Rick put those in several years ago because the road shoulder has moved back to about the edge of the asphalt. Mm -hmm. We still have a good stable slope, but there's no way to move that out because it's steep to the creek without yeah. putting an extension on that big culvert. 
So we just put some markers up there to delineate that edge is what yeah. we're trying to do. Well, what he was worried about, that somebody thought that was the driveway and they were going to turn in there. Well, perhaps we should look at it, maybe space them out a little further apart, maybe. Yeah, uh, either put that a, or put one in the middle or something. Or, or I, 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 haven't, I, I haven't, he called me about it the other day and I just hadn't had time to go by there and that's why I was asking you about it. Yeah. Because no, he, he makes a good point. So I'll look at that again. We might even just put up a sign that says narrow roadway with a delineator, one delineator. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Some, something. something, because he was sure concerned that it was going to be a problem. Yeah, I, I wouldn't argue. And I don't, I don't know. No, that's a good point. You know, I'll, so I'll take a better look at that. I, I haven't looked at it. I, I told him I'd get by there and look at it, and I haven't. So if you happen to want to look at it that way, yeah, you could turn off and fall off the road. So yeah, I, I that's could, that's what he was concerned I, about. That was a, his whole concern that somebody might turn in between those two thinking that was a driveway. It's a good concern. I think the best thing would be put a sign up that says narrow roadway with one delineator so you don't have that tendency to turn mm -hmm. in. So it'll serve the same purpose. Yeah. So I'll I'll do I'll look at that. So okay. good. Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Nope. Good. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Bonnie, come on up. You that don't know her, Bonnie's our noxious weed coordinator or uncoordinator or something. Weed killer. Weed slayer. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Okay. 26 seconds. 26 seconds. Ready, set, go. All right, today I'm going to talk about the meeting of the minds, um, meeting we had. Just to recap about it. Um, we're going to do a throwback Gigantor weed stuff, grants and funding, and then updates. So the meeting of the minds, we had two advisory board members. We had the BLM there, municipalities for Cortez, Minkus, and Dolores. We had MVIC rep there, High Desert Conservation District, Mesa Verde National Park, um, somebody from CDOT, and then CSU. So as far as Friata fights, the city of Cortez, BLM, MVIC, and Mesa Verde National Park are all currently actively managing the Friata fights. Um, they're pretty much eradicated on Mesa Verde National Park. They're way ahead of us. Um, Cortez is doing a great job. BLM has been working down McElmo Creek, removing some, and then MVIC is removing some on different portions of their own ditch. Town of Mancus is getting good control of their noxious weeds using herbicide at Boyle Park, and then they use organic in the other areas. The city of Cortez, um, their code enforcement has been doing great. We, om we almost have Myrtle Spurge eradicated within the um, municipality of Cortez, which is great. Um, they do a good job at notifying landowners for noxious weeds. Town of Dolores is working on... Um, getting a management plan. They might adopt ours. We're just kind of looking into that. They need to get a better inventory of what they got going on. And then MVIC, they have one licensed sprayer. He expressed the need to really educate landowners on managing their ditches for noxious weeds. So that's a public awareness thing that I will be working on. Uh, BLM, Garth Nelson, has actually moved into Corey Ertl's position at the U.S. Forest Service, so Mike Jensen is temporary filling Garth Nelson's position for the noxious weed management for the BLM. Um, like I said, they've been working hard down McElmo Canyon for the phreatophyte removal. They've also been kind of prioritizing Russian knapweed treatments um, throughout Montezuma County, mainly, well, prioritizing the end of Road 20. It's pretty bad down there. CDOT has three to four dedicated sprayers for their large jurisdiction, about six counties. They have over 2,000 miles of highway that they're managing. Um, they're doing the best they can. They're doing all in-house treatments now. They don't hire any contractors um, to help them treat weeds. So it's really challenging for them to, to maintain their entire jurisdiction for treating weeds at the correct timings. CSU and High Desert Conservation District, we're going to work with them on doing some reseeding seminars this summer. So that's pretty much the recap. Um, we're going to be doing that at least once a year, just inviting all the managers to try to get on the same page, um, see what everybody's doing. Um, so I think this season is going to be a very tall weed season. 
I think these Gigantors were in year 2017. It's just kind of a fun contest of who can find the tallest weed. So this Canada thistle was found north of Dolores. It was 6.1 feet tall. Next. This is a musk thistle. It was found on McElmo Canyon, 10 feet tall exactly. Next. This is the smallest thistle. Ethan Proud found this guy in Archuleta County. This is Russian Napoli. This was down McElmo Canyon, almost six feet tall. Poison Hemlock. I think this is down County Road S, eight and a half feet tall. Corey Crest, three feet tall. This was down County Road M, out east. Cutleaf Teasel, 8.6 feet tall. The biggest Russian olive that we found is 26 inch diameter. This one was 19 years old, so it's grown pretty fast. Dalmatian toad flax, 4.7 feet tall. This was out on road DD. These are the mutant thistles that Eddie Lewis found. Uh, common mullein. The height is nine feet. So we'll try to break some of those records this year with all that rain. It's just a fun little contest that we have. If you guys find any big weeds, take a picture, measure it, and then let me know. All right, funding. I think I lost that. Um, we were awarded $30,000 to the Colorado Department of Agriculture for our cost share program. So our total budget will be $50,000 this year, which will be great because I think we had at least twenty to 30000 that were asked to be reimbursed, but we didn't have the funding to reimburse them. So hopefully we'll be able to reimburse all the applicants that send their application in this year. Uh, we got the U.S. Forest Service Disaster Relief Grant. Last year it was a two-year. We have about 50000 remaining on that grant. Um, the America the Beautiful Challenge is still being finalized, but we should be receiving $150,000 for a three-year period. Still waiting on notifications for the National Fish and Wildlife Fund Five Star and Urban Waters Restoration Grant and the CDPHE Grant Environmental Justice Grant. Probably hear back from those in a month or two. And then I am working on the congressionally direct spending requests and then a fire grant with Robert. Updates. Um, we're working on getting some specialty herbicides sold in Montezuma County. Um, products like Trump Card, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's really good on kosher. Nobody sells it around here. So I tend to sell it to private landowners because they can't get it, but I'd rather not do that. So I'm trying to work with Basin Co-op and some other places to try to get some of these specialty herbicides available. Um, we're brainstorming ways to address herbicide misuse in Montezuma County, planning a beginner workshop for weed ID and intro to herbicides probably early May. And then we're just planning for the 2023 season. We're replacing one of our spray trucks tanks. Um, we're doing some repair and maintenance. And then we'll be meeting with Rob Inglehart weekly on incorporating some mechanical management of the invasive species along roadsides. Is that 26 seconds? Okay. <laughs> you guys have any questions? You participating in Ag Expo or Home and Garden Show? We're going to do the Garden Show. I don't okay. think we're going to have time really to do the Ag Expo this year, but we'll be at the Garden Show. Good. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Justin from the fairgrounds, come on up. Good morning, Justin. Okay. <clears throat> well, I can, s yeah, I'll just start with that right there. So that's our um, prop proposal that Cooper had sent um, the state 
for approval for the fire suppression that we're trying to get done. I know I sent you guys that proposal, so I'm sure you got that all read over and understand it 100%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. We'll probably hear back from state. I'm assuming they, they told me it shouldn't take long, maybe just a couple weeks. So they submitted that middle of last week. So I'm hoping maybe by the end of next week, we'll get an idea whether or not state's going to approve that for us. And then we can kind of move on and decide what we want to do with the Montezuma Water Company side of things. So that's where we are with that. Uh, with our regular stuff, uh, we did have a couple junior rodeos here the last couple weeks. Um, February 18th and 19th, and then March 4th and 5th was a makeup rodeo that they had to cancel earlier in the year because we had lots of snow. Um, we also had a hunter safety training out there <clears throat> February 18th and 19th. And then coming up, we are starting to get into our uh, annual big shows that we do out there. So after the commodity giveaway this, this next weekend, then we're going to be looking forward to the Home and Garden Show, which you guys were just talking about. Uh, March 31st and April 1st. Um, after that, we're going to do the Ag Expo out there, which is a little change up from the years past because we generally have the Ag Expo before the Home and Garden Show, but this year we're going to change it up a little bit and see how this does. Um, and then the end of April, we're looking at the Cortez Gun Show coming in. So that's what we got going on. And then we've still had winter practices out there, and we'll continue to have those through next week. And then uh, beginning March 20th is when we're going to start taking that indoor arena out so we can get ready for those big shows. So those practices will, will continue until then. Um, other than that, what we've been kind of doing out there is still doing some painting projects on the inside of the arena. Uh, we, do, we still have a little bit of uh, rails of paint and stuff that we're going to probably just take a day and finish up after we get that arena taken out. That way we can just get the airless out and kind of knock it out real quick. The other thing we've been working on pretty heavy now is the outdoor restroom remodel. We did get it all demoed on the inside of those restrooms. Uh, what we've been working on now is kind of trying to move our drainage pipes because uh, those toilets have to be moved over uh, to meet specifications and stuff. So. We were hoping we were just going to be able to saw cut that, kind of move those over, tap back into our existing plumbing lines. But when we started to tear into that, our, our plumbing is actually running through and was poured into our footers. <clears throat> so those footers out there are about 28 inches wide from what we gather. And all that plumbing is, looks like it was set, and then the footers were poured around it. So we are now in the process of trying to figure out how to go about running our plumbing, which we got a couple ideas we might be able to go with. Uh, I got the plumber that's supposed to be trying to come out there and take a look at it and see if we can coordinate an easier way. So maybe we can get our plumbing on the outside of that building somehow and you know just do a little couple drills through our, through our footers to get it out there. And, you know, just chip away a little bit that we need to do. So that's kind of where we are with that. Um, once we get through this process of doing the plumbing, then I don't think the rest of it will take very much to, to complete because that, that's our biggest challenge of the restrooms. So that's where we are there. Um, other than that, I mean, that's, that's about all we got going on out there. We've just been messing with snow, ice, mud. So... <laughs> Kind of like everybody else. Yeah. We're not going to complain if spring comes around anytime soon, but it has been nice. So and that's all I got. So all right. You guys got any questions? No. S appreciate do, it. Do you want to expound a little bit? Because Jessica's here on the um, flea market yeah, that we're looking at. Yeah, we can. Um, so we, have, we had the idea to kind of do a flea market out there. Uh, maybe once a month through the summer for about four months to start trying and see if that's something that we could get going on at the at the fairgrounds and another avenue for vendors to maybe get out and sell some of their products. Um, right now we're trying to look at maybe doing a Sunday first of the month kind of thing out there. Uh, and the only reason we were kind of looking at that date was because 
it doesn't really interfere with farmers markets on Saturdays and, and some of the other stuff that's going other days. Um, we don't have all the logistics figured out, but uh, that's something we are trying to, to look at moving forward with and maybe test the waters this year starting in, I believe, May is what we're looking at, May, June, July, and August. Um, and then maybe that's something that will grow into something future. So Well, we'll see. Um, yeah. yeah, that's where we are with that. Um, that's all I got on there. Appreciate it. Okay. You bet. Thank you, gentlemen. Jessica Thurman, our economic development person. Come on in. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm excited for the flea market. I hope we can get that going and started and have lots of good stuff out there. Because we all need more junk, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Or a place to sell it. Right, exactly. Um, so lots of things ramping up. I've definitely been a lot more busy the past couple months. It's kind of nice to see all this planning and all these meetings that I've been going through over the past year finally start to pay off. Um, last week, I had a pretty big week with housing. I participated in the Cortez Housing um, Steering Committee for their assessment. Um, they're moving in a good direction, working on trying to get their consultants straightened out um, for their assessment to be completed. And then I also participated in the Region 9. Um, we have a meeting every Friday that SHAC facilitates. And there's some really positive things within the, not just our county or in our municipalities, but within the region that has to do with housing. Um, so I think we definitely will see some great progress with that in the next year or two. Um, last week, I also participated in the Montezuma Cortez High School Futures Fair, which was so fun. Um, it was awesome to see such articulate and respectful kids come and talk and learn about what they want to do in their future. It was a really, really neat event. Um, I look forward to participating next year with it because it was so great. Um, one thing that I did do last week, I, we had a meeting with a United Way Food Security Action Team um, looking at how we can best support our community through this, we're calling it the SNAP cliff, when the SNAP benefits get cut. Um, I know Vicki's done some outreach with some public engagement around how we can better use our food stamps and our benefits. Um, but this cut that's coming here, or that it's, it's already here, um, is really going to impact a lot of people in our community, especially our senior population. Um, they're looking at some of them um, getting their benefits cut to om less than almost like $20 a month. Um, and so that's going to definitely create some hindrance on some of the food banks and the food pantries that we have in the community. So we're looking at how we can just kind of put a tourniquet on that wound and try to do some food drives, um, help with trying to get some more food um, into the food banks because they're seeing um, their resources utilized almost double to what they were before COVID. Um, so they're seeing a lot of stressors on what they're needing um, with supply shortages and just not getting the amount of food that they were before. Uh, so hopefully we can try to organize something, set something up to where we can support that because we don't want anybody going hungry. Um, when people are hungry, that turns into all kinds of different issues, health issues, criminal issues, all kinds of different things. So working with um, that team to try to develop some um, extra resources or support for that. Uh, lots of grants. I've done lots of grants works the past couple weeks. Uh, we did get passed through for the Colorado Opportunity Now grant. I submitted a letter of intent, um, and we were moved to the second phase, which is really super exciting. Um, that's going to be a pretty substantial amount of money if we are able to pass through and get that grant awarded, um, and that will be for workforce development. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we also submitted our economic development action grant, organization action grant, um, which will be for that community perspectives I talked about last time. We're working with all the municipalities to really figure out a ways that we can best market Montezuma County and the different communities to bring in new industry, um, bring in new businesses and support the businesses that are here. And then um, there is some funds from DOLA for a roadmaps project. 
There's about 40,000 that's coming down that we can apply for, um, for projects that have been identified throughout um, our roadmaps plan. Um, I'm really wanting to do something agriculturally based and support our ag industry. So we're looking at um, different options that we have identified in that plan. One of the biggest ones that we see that might be the most shovel ready is to best support some processing facilities, um, do some feasibility studies and look at how we can best support um, bringing in some more um, processing facility for our ag industry. Um, and then the last thing, of course, just that roadmaps life that I live. I'll be presenting to all of the town councils, presenting to main guests tomorrow um, on our implementation of the Montezuma Community Collective and working on trying to get that going and ramping up and getting more community involvement and actually getting those projects started and off the ground. So I think that's all I have. Probably forgot something in there, but I think that's all I have for now. Staying busy. Staying busy, trying to make things happen. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yep. All right, guys. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Shift gears into unfinished business. Mr. Spratlin. Mr. Unfinished, I guess. I'm always unfinished. Morning, Commissioners. Morning. Morning. Morning, Miss Kim. Good morning. <coughs> Ian. Mr. Anderson. All right. So. Montezuma County Debris Management Plan, we went over it yesterday. Uh, there was no issues. We made a couple of small changes, and it's uh, ready to go. Uh, we did uh, vet it, of course, with uh, Road and Bridge and Mel and I, and then we took it to the Emergency Ops Center, and we did an actual training on it to see if it's something we can actually work with, and we actually modified some of that then. So it's ready to go. I actually have the sign sheet here. I just need you guys, if you approve or deny. <laughs> you're getting tired of seeing me every week, aren't you? No, you're, you're all right. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So this will be added to the emergency operations plan in the back, one of the annexes, which, uh, and then we'll work on a couple other recovery plans, et cetera, People et cetera. Don't realize how important debris management is when it comes to some of this stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. It, it is. It, Just to get it out of your way and put it in a spot and get on with what you're supposed to be doing. Well, there's a lot of issues, like I mentioned yesterday when I went to the Hurricane Ian, I learned a lot about debris management and how you separate the piles. And then, of course, we knew some of this, but actually being there made a big difference in uh, what you need to take out quickly yeah. and what you can leave for a long time and separate in private property versus, you know, easements, et cetera. And then the cost, moving all of that and make sure you document all the costs, have way tickets, et cetera. Because FEMA is going to want that when we try to get our reimbursement two or three years later. Yeah. So. But just you, you can see all of it on paper, but when you run across it for real, it's. It's a. Yeah, a whole new game, <laughs> it's a new ball game. You look at your plan and go, yeah, okay, uh, let's go to work. Yeah. So. Yeah, it helped us, and so we we've, we've actually been running off of that for three years, 2020, but. We were never really officially cleaned it up and got the board to sign it. So I thought that was uh, ready to go. So I moved to approve the master plan copy of the Montezuma County Debris Management Plan as presented. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, gentlemen. Now, number two. Got that somewhere. So this is uh, 
me memorandum of understanding between uh, Montezuma Cortez School District RE1 and the Board of County Commissioners, allowing uh, the school district to utilize the fairgrounds as a reunification center. Uh, we've already had this signed and taken care of in 21. So we're just up in it with new signatures, uh, the new superintendent. Nothing has changed in the MOU. It's the same as when you signed it before. Ran it by uh, our attorney, and he's, he smiled and said it was okay. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard to get him to smile, but, yeah, he, he said it's okay. So basically it's just to approve it again and get new signatures on it. I also have uh, Mr. Anderson to sign it as well. That's any questions on that? No, uh -uh. Okay. just updating because we've changed a few personnel on the right. I move to approve this updated memorandum of understanding between Montezuma County Cortez School District RE1 and Montezuma County Board of County Commissioners as presented. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. There's his original signature. Mm -hmm. That's all I have, gentlemen. See you next, no, week after. Okay. Unless I got more stuff we got to bring up. So we should be good. Thank you, Jim. Any questions at all? No. On any? No. Nope. All right. All right. Thank you. Now we come to the Heritage Museum lease. So we're going to move him because he needs to get the lease to myself and Ian. Okay. It's, I, I think it, it's just basically an updated release right. of what they have now but we don't have copies of it so we are we moved him to another agenda okay we'll go into new business with a letter of support for the town of Dolores I moved to sign this letter of support for the town of Dolores uh, they're applying for a phase two water system improvements. Then they're trying to secure funding for that to the senator's discretionary funding. I'll second that. Dolores needs an upgraded system. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Alrighty, as soon as we can get Mr. Dietrich in here, we'll proceed to natural resources. Here he comes. <laughs> Travis went out that door. Yeah. <laughs> Come on down, James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we sent somebody to look for you, and now we're short of guys. He'll be back. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so we want to kind of give you, well, first of all, I'm sorry I missed last week. I got sick again. It seems like it's just been a revolving door for uh, sickness here. What happens when your wife drives a school bus, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So uh, I'll lead off with talking a little bit about the Dwarf Working Group, which is our primary um, kind of vehicle for collaboration on you know, forest restoration, watershed health, as well as uh, you know, wildfire mitigation in the county. Um, so currently, um, so I'm on the, the Dwarf uh, Coordinating Committee. Um, we're currently working on a financial strategy for the coming year to really kind of focus on stabilizing um, our facilitators uh, position within in Dwarf, and that's Danny Margolis. Uh, so Danny operates uh, primarily through the Onward Foundation, and his position is paid for largely by the U.S. Forest Service and is supplemented by uh, whatever um, additional grants that we can bring in. So uh, currently right now we're working with the San Juan National Forest to develop a new scope of work for 2023 um, with the updates based on stakeholder priorities, outreach and education capacity being kind of the primary areas of, of focus on that. Uh, Dwarf will continue working in uh, coordinating and supporting a, a, an upcoming workshop on community wildfire uh, mitigation. Um, and then we'll continue our conversations on how to bring in appropriately uh, scaled industry to really reflect the, the volume of timber and forest byproducts that we've got out there with particular emphasis on things like uh, the POL, the, uh, the stuff other than logs, basically. Um, and and I, as you know, I think we, we've uh, got some, you know, some traction going on out there. I think you've all kind of been aware of uh, some uh, of Dave Sitton's work with that pellet mill. And, uh, you know, it sounds like there's maybe a few glitches with it. It hasn't got it quite uh, figured out yet. But as you all know, if you're a farmer, you know, you get a new piece of equipment. It takes a little bit sometimes to get it dialed in and figure that whole thing out. But it, it sort of sounds like he's really making some progress on that. So we're pretty excited. Uh, hopefully he can get, get something uh, online here quickly and, and we'll have another forest product that, uh, that can come from Montezuma County. Um, so we'll continue working with uh, Jim Spratlin and other stakeholders on uh, additional funding opportunities that may, uh, may arise. Um, a few of them, I'll list a few of them here. We're working uh, currently on the Community Wildfire Defense Grant. And uh, we'll meet this Thursday with Jim Spratlin and other community members. We're trying to figure out um, how we can define projects and concerns that we may be able to tap into that uh, line of funding for, and then we'll work with our, our uh, grant writer here, Robert, on that to, to help uh, formulate a good proposal and, and get that submitted. Um, we also have the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, the RCPP grant. Um, and with that one, uh, through NRCS, the uh, our, um, the lead partner must work directly with agricultural producers to support the development of new conservation structures and approaches. Um, and again, that fits in pretty good with the work we're doing uh, through Dwarf because what we're really trying to look at is large landowners along the edge of the Wooey who have, you know, a, a large acreage, say, that's a, you know, ponderosa pine or something along those lines. Um, so anyway, we'll look for, for ways to, uh, to dovetail their needs into whatever, uh, you know, grant opportunities we can, can find through uh, the RCPP. Um, we also have the Forest Restoration and Wildfire Risk Risk Mitigation Grant. Uh, we call that the Fur Worm Grant. Um, that program provides state support through competitive grant funds that uh, encourage community level actions across the state uh, for specific purposes. And again, we're really kind of focused in on the WUI on this one. And again, I think we're looking at, at, at uh, trying to help uh, large landowners uh, connect with, with resources to help them manage their forest um, as best they can. And again, there's also the uh, component of trying to use uh, woody material slash, essentially, the POL um, for any kind of uh, useful purpose that we can, can come up with. Um, and there's also the AIM grant, um, and this is a Colorado-based nonprofit uh, grant through uh, COCO, uh, Coalitions and Collaborative Incorporated. Uh, and that's implementation and mitigation uh, work for uh, fire adapted concepts. And again, we're working within the WE on that. So all these are really, there's kind of a vein uh, of commonality that runs through all these. Um, and then the last one is um, we're evaluating the uh, CWCB Watershed Restoration Grant. Um, and that pro program really focuses on, uh, again, wildfire ready watersheds. Um, in action plans within the WUI, but this one also kind of covers um, some of the work we're already um, engaged in on federal lands. Um, 
And then I'll kind of move on. Uh, this is also kind of similar and related. Um, the Collaborative uh, Forest Landscape Restoration Program, and I've talked about this before. This is a CFLRP program. So we've worked out a, uh, within that collaborative group, we've been really working on trying to come up with a set of desired conditions and a model, uh, a way that we can kind of test projects as they come forward to see if they meet all the CFLRP requirements because that's a congressionally designated fund. And so they've got certain goals and outcomes that we're supposed to meet. And so, uh, so for example, we've got um, across the San Juan National Forest roughly 185 projects that they've got slated for this year. We're trying to come up with a model that helps us evaluate each one of these projects to see which one actually fits the goals of the CFLRP, as well as the goals that we have within our community too. So um, that's, that's kind of the purpose of that. Um, I'm also working, as, as I've stated before, on and continuing to work with the BLM on the big game corridors and the Gunnison sage grouse. So we've got, and I, by the way, I've been continuing to work with, uh, with Dolores County on that. I stay in regular touch with Steve Garcher on that. We both attend those, those meetings regularly. Um, so we've got some things that are upcoming. We've got the Sage Grouse Draft Alternatives Plans, and that should be done around June. And at, when that's released to the public, we'll have a 60-day public comment uh, window. And we really want to make sure that we get some comments in on that so that we can maintain standing within that program, within that project. Um, and then it's sort of the same thing with the big game. So we should have a draft RMP amendment that's coming forward in April or May. Um, and that should initiate a 90-day public comment period. And it's the same thing with that. We, we certainly want to get our comments in on that so we can maintain standing. Um, I think within both of these, it's been uh, quite a, it's been an arduous process going through all this. Kind of, uh, you know, a lot of meetings. And, uh, and I think I shared with you the draft alternatives plan that came out for the sage grouse. I mean, it's about, what, 92 pages or something of all kinds of alternatives. And we're trying to figure out how we mix and match those and come up with um, a preferred alternative that kind of meets, you know, as best we can, everybody's uh, objectives and concerns. Um, one of the things I'm really kind of concerned about with that is the, uh, you know, they've been, been nominating new ACECs. And uh, there's certainly been some push to nominate unoccupied habitat as ACEC. And of course, Montezuma County, the whole northern portion of the county, is really unoccupied habitat, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I have different opinions on that. We don't need to get into that. But uh, um, so we're, we're really, uh, you know, trying to, to really kind of focus. I mean, if they go down, go down this ACEC pathway, it should be occupied habitat in places where it's actually going to make a meaningful difference. And then also, we don't even know what happens, you know, for example, if we fail to save the sage grouse, it, it goes extinct. Uh, what happens to an ACEC after that? And uh, BLM has no real definitive answer for that at this point. So um, my theory is that kind of counts into, you know, the 30 by 30 uh, movement. But anyway, that's a, that, um, we can discuss some of this later. Um, but we're, we're staying engaged in that. So... Um, we're also uh, still working on the uh, OREC recreation strategies. Um, so we've gotten a notice to proceed from the state. So I've put together a general services contract. We're under contract with RPI out of Durango to help us move forward with that project. We had our first meeting last Monday to refine a project uh, outreach and strategy, and we're beginning to work on uh, the uh, use and economic impact study. So we've been collecting some background information on this as, we, as we've been going along. Um, and so Region 9 is, is kind of a treasure trove of information on that. So we're tapping into all that that we can and also providing any other information through other efforts that have happened within the county. We've connected with uh, um, uh, Brian from uh, um, Mesa Verde Country on that. He's a part of our team, and so we're looking very carefully at, um, at the information that he has. And also, we participated in that craft tourism workshop uh, kind of pre-COVID, right before COVID hit. But we had a pretty good inventory of, of a lot of our assets and resources that we have here in the county, and we're shuffling that on off to RPI to help, uh, help us kind of analyze and, and uh, prepare some information on that. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up to the commissioners, one of, one of the uh, data collection tools that we may look at, uh, look at pretty hard is called, it's basically it's an in, infrared camera system. 
So one of the things we want to know about is trail counts, um, counts at parking lots, um, counts at virtually, you know, for, for example, the fairgrounds, things like that. Um, so the investigation that I've done uh, kind of leads to one particular system that seems like it can do some of the things that we want it to, well, more of the things that we want it to do than any other system I found. It's called the TRAFX uh, counting system. And basically what this is, is uh, it, it's trail counters and also uh, a docking system in software that helps you to analyze the data as it comes in. This wouldn't be something I'd be very interested in unless we could really um, make this useful to some other departments in the county. And I'm thinking like, for example, the fairgrounds. You know, we've got the ability to do traffic counts, um, but that's, that's kind of a pretty heavy request of the road department. It takes a lot to set those things up. Uh, generally, it's almost a three-man crew to go set those things up. Right. You really need a flagger out there and stuff with the increased traffic we've got. So this might be one way that we can, can accomplish some of that stuff. The road department might actually be able to make use of this too, because this particular system counts not only things like individuals, but, um, but also bicycles. Um, it also has the ability to, to count cars. Um, it's a relatively low cost system. It's uh, running at about $2,500. You get three counters plus the software and, and uh, the docking system and everything it takes to run that. So um, anyway, I'll do, do some uh, additional research on this. And if I can't find another uh, potential uh, vendor for something like this, I'll bring it back to the commissioners and then we can make a decision on whether or not we want to move forward with this. But again, it costs, uh, the one I'm looking at is about $2,500. I could certainly... Uh, pull from my budget to cover that and hopefully we have something that we can use for years into the future that's fairly low cost and easy for people to like justin to be able to, to go out and, and make use of so right um then of course i'm also working on the ihop affordable housing strategy and we've been meeting monthly with our consultants on that Right now, we're looking at setting up a workshop. It's, it's, uh, we were angling in on the end of March. Things have gotten kind of uh, jammed up and complicated there, so it looks like it's going to get pushed into early April. But what we're really trying to do is uh, work on, on uh, bringing together you know, all of our planning departments from the municipalities as well as the county and really kind of focus on that one and three-mile area. Um, you know, there's there's just some difficulties in working through um, issues in, in those particular areas. And we thought that it would be really helpful to get everybody together in one room, start working through how we're going to handle that, try to improve our communications back and forth in between departments. Um, and then, of course, you know, the purpose is really to try to identify areas where affordable housing would be appropriate within that area. And again, I think we all, all realize that really you know, within our municipalities is where we have a lot of potential. And so we're going to focus on those. But, but anything that's within that one-mile area, um, I feel like probably has some potential. You know, we, we'll evaluate it and just see what kind of comes up. But, um, you know, at the other end of that, oh, and also I want to mention that we would be including utility providers, you know, the water. Water is one of the ones that's always kind of a, a you know, a, a hiccup when it comes to annexation and things like that. So we'll try to work through some of those issues and see if we can't come up with a, a better way of, of uh, approaching those problems and working together on that. So, um, and then uh, Paz to Mesa Verde, segment A. Uh, we, and that's one that I think was on the, uh, um, the list to talk about today. Um, <laughs> we've got a DocuSign contract that came through on that. Um, uh, from my perspective, it looks like we're, we're ready to uh, go ahead and sign that contract. Um, I can't do anything without that contract and a notice to proceed, so, but I, I think we're at that point here on this. And I, I looked this over. Um, looks fine to me from a legal perspective. I mean, it's, it's very similar to many of the contracts we get from the state and, and some of the issues that we've talked about in the past with that, but, but really there's, there's nothing here that gives great cause for concern. Okay, glad to hear that. Do you have anything, Jerry? I, I don't. I mean, this project is what, 25 years old? Oh, geez, yeah. I think the concept is that old. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've been working on this pretty hard for like, you know, last, what, probably 10, 10 years plus. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it seems so easy. You know, how, how hard could it be to just build a trail along the highway right away? Wow. Um, a lot harder than what you'd think, uh, well, you know, especially when you get those agencies involved. And actually, I will, we'll, I'll delve into that here in a little bit. We've got some other headaches with some of these agencies, and, and we may need to tap into the, the commissioners to help uh, move this off of, 
off of square one. So, okay. but anyway, I'll, I'll, uh, that's cut a little bit later here in the report. Um, so, in, in, you know, I, I, for me, I'm ready to have that, that document signed any, any time, but I don't think there's any, um, you know, real pressing uh, need to do that today. If you want to wait till next week, that's just fine. So. I don't see a need to. I don't. Go ahead. I need to. <clears throat> I move to approve project MTFC 320-007-25346 between Monson County and the state of Colorado. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. We'll get that signed for you. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. You bet. Well, I'll kind of continue along with the report on Paso Mesa Verde, and I've got a little bit later on, too, on that. But uh, uh, the other thing that we're working on is Segment B, and that is the section between uh, the Montezuma County Fairgrounds and the Mesa Verde entrance. So uh, we're, we're at the process of doing some of the geotechnical um, reporting on that. And uh, we had to get a, a permit through the state land board to allow us access into that that particular property to allow them to do the sampling and everything they need to do in there. Um, and so we've got that, that squared away and they should be out there. Um, they may have already actually been out there to do that. So hopefully we're moving ahead on that. Um, we're also working with the BLM on their standard form 299. Um, that's the application for transportation, utility systems, telecom, and facilities on federal lands and property. Um, so we were told initially that we didn't think that that was going to be uh, any kind of an issue, but uh, we've got a whole change of uh, personnel down at the BLM right now. So we're, we're kind of uh, trying to get the new, new folks trained up on everything and get them on board. And uh, it sounds like they, there's a uh, you know, positive traction on that. So hopefully we'll get that, uh, that form uh, back to us here pretty soon. It has been submitted and it is in their, their um ballpark right now so hopefully it'll get, we'll see it here soon um, I have been working um, you know outside of the county um, uh, just networking with the regional trail working group uh, to make sure because one of the purposes um, is really kind of um, establish that highway 160 trail corridor um, so that it can be connected to to a greater area so for example continuing from uh, from Mancus all the way over into La Plata County. So the purpose of that is really to kind of understand what the La Plata County side is doing. And so they're, they're actively trying to get trail from uh, at least the uh, uh, kind of May Day area um, uh, westward to the top of Mancus Hill. And so we'll just continue to kind of stay in, in touch with them to understand what they're doing and share what we're doing with them also. I've uh, been working with uh, Mancus in the Mancus Source Water Protection Plan. I've participated in that process over the last year. Um, we'll be meeting this Thursday to go over the draft plan that they've put together. I've already reviewed it, and I personally, uh, there's a few things I have a slight disagreement with. I don't think it's anything that's... Uh, you know, worth uh, rocking the boat over by any, any means, but I did want to ask the commissioners if there was anything that you had in mind that we need to, to be aware of or concerns that we need to bring forward. I don't have anything. Um, yeah, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not up on it, James, to tell you the truth, what, what all they've come up with now. Okay. So I need to look at it. Well, we could. Okay. I'll try to get it looked Do at. Do I need to send that to you, Gerald? Because I could forward that to you if you like. Unless okay. you have a copy already, so I'll, I'll just email it to you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, just email me a copy of it if you okay. would. Okay. Sounds That'd good. Be great. Right. Um, and then, of course, we're getting down to the wolf reintroduction, everybody's favorite thing here. Um, the DEIS for the 10J experimental population status is out through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so I'm working on comments um, so that we can submit a formal letter on that one. We did submit uh, uh, comments to through the CPW. Um, they had an opportunity um, through their online portal, um, and I sent those comments to the commissioners. Um, I think um, you know it's how, these were pretty basic comments. Um, they they really include you know managing wolves under the 10J experimental category of the Endangered Species Act, and that really provides more flexibility to the management uh, of that animal. Um, Montezuma County and other affected counties should receive reasonable compensation for impacts to businesses that uh, declines in wildlife herds um, will, will have an economic impact on us, uh, you know, for example, through the hunting and recreation. Um, and then that livestock producers should have a fair and rapid reparations for economic damages suffered to wolf depredation. Uh, 
Um, and that CPW should establish population caps on wolves, and that when a population of wolves exceeds that cap, then we should implement some kind of a trophy hunting opportunity for, uh, um, to be managed by CPW, to manage that wolf population at, at the, uh, the projected and, and uh, desired uh, population. Um, and then uh, CPW should establish an adequate and fully funded budget before uh, the reintroduction happens. The budget should be funded by counties that voted for wolf reintroduction. Counties that did not vote for wolf reintroduction should be eligible for compensation for any expense related to wolf management annually. Um, and that wolves that uh, migrate from uh, to the front range county should be encouraged as much as possible to stay on the front range, uh, especially any wolves that may relocate to Rocky Mountain National Park. Relocate, relocation back to the western slope, um, in our view, is just really not acceptable or desirable. Um, and uh, really, I mean, the last point on that is, I mean, the state voted for it. Why shouldn't the rest of the state enjoy the wolves too, I guess? So um, that's kind of... Uh, and I think uh, Doris County kind of echo echoed every single one of these comments. Um, so uh, getting back to the pass of Mesa, to Mesa Verde, um, we're working with uh, central federal lands on reimbursement requirements. And we've hit a real snag with uh, central federal lands on this. We've brought a lot of money to the table through MMOF on this. And the difficulty that we're reaching right now is that uh, we're not able to get reimbursed for it because Central federal lands will not provide the documentation that CDOT needs to be able to provide that reimbursement. The sticking point that I have with this is the same documentation that CFL is requiring for everybody else to, to ask for reimbursement from them. In other words, they're not following their own rules. Um, so I, you know, I, we feel like we've got a really good person through CFL that we're working with, and he's on our side on this and everything. But uh, as we've worked this on up the food chain, they are just absolutely refusing to provide the documentation. And it's pretty standard stuff. I mean, it's, it's you know, is, is this project being performed within the performance dates? What is the date the work was performed? What was the work that was performed? Who did the work? Um, what's the hour relate, rate? And, and how much are they billing to it? Um, this is pretty standard stuff, and we have to do this for all the federal grants. And, you know, federal do dollars are public dollars, and this should be a, a, a you know, a public uh, process, uh, at least in my opinion on it. It feels like the, the hang-up is that they don't want to discuss the rates that they're paying their subcontractors on this. But that's exactly what we have to provide to them, and we have to document everything from our right. subcontractors. Is there an ombudsman overseeing this? In any no, way? to the best of my knowledge, not. So and that's one of the difficulties. I mean, and I think CDOT, by the way, is on our side on this. Um, they, you know, all they're asking for is the standard stuff that the feds are requiring them to provide. And, and they're uncomfortable um, providing reimbursement, you know, without having, you know, all those boxes checked. And I, I don't blame them. I mean, I, and, and so it's really, really conf confounding, I guess, to, uh, to work with a federal agency that, um, but it's not surprising that can't can't follow their own rules. So uh, this is one we may need to tap into the commissioners if we can um, to work this on up. Uh, I you know we're still investigating. I, we haven't exhausted every every avenue yet, and so you know when we're trying to be relatively sensitive about this because CFL is a is a big funder. Yeah. For, yeah and so we don't want to really kind of upset those guys too much, but but at the same time you know. Good land, you gotta follow your own rules, you know, so. We just met with Katie Fersh out of Hickenlooper's office. Would she be any assistance to that? Possibly so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, you know, we'll, we'll uh, continue working with, with the avenues that we already have within CFL and give them just a little more time to, to unravel this thing. Um, but I, I'm just getting more uncomfortable with it all the time and wondering if we're really gonna get to an end resolve on this. And now, uh, CDOT is saying, well, you know, gosh, if you guys got, can't provide the reimbursement, uh, all the documentation on this, uh, perhaps we need to reallocate those funds somewhere else. So we're at risk of losing funding over this, too. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty distraught over this. And, and uh, well, anyway, we'll continue pushing on them, you know, as best we can. And I'll keep in contact with the commissioners, let you guys know where we're at with everything. And, and if we need need to pull you all in for some uh, some extra 
horsepower, then I, I certainly won't hesitate to do that. Sounds good. Uh, we're uh, applying for TAP funding on the, uh, the Manca side. Again, one of the issues also we're hitting on this is the inflation. And so while we had a budget that was looking pretty good two years ago, that's not looking very good now. And it's almost like we gotta got to go out for the, almost the same amount. I mean, everything's almost doubled on everything. Kind so like building a bridge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, I know we're, we're in the same, same boat there too. So, um, But anyway, we'll, we'll uh, continue to try to search for any additional funding that we can so that we can at least get that side up to the point where we can have a soft surface trail constructed. We get something on the ground, and I feel like the momentum is there, and we're going to continue moving it forward. But we do need to get something on the ground, and it's slated for construction in 2026, which seems a little far off in the future, but it's not very far. So we're, we're going to continue just going you know, full bore, trying to get, get any additional funding for that that we can possibly line up. So um, the other thing is, I think I've uh, mentioned the commissioners before, we need a uh, benefit cost analysis on that. So one of the new approaches that we're taking on this is that uh, we think we can roll this in to an existing contract that we have with our consultant. In, in fact, the, the, the place I'd like to place that is in the segment A, which is the one that we've, we've just signed that IGA on. Now, that, that may uh, trigger a new IGA coming around for, uh, for an amendment, and I believe that's probably what they are going to ask. But I do believe that we can roll that in to, through the existing consultant. They seem to have the capacity to do that, and that BCA should apply to the entire trail, not just that segment. But that segment has not uh, been started on yet, and so that's the one where I think it probably fits the best uh, but we'll continue to uh, investigate that and make sure that CDOT concurs with that and uh, and that that's a, a viable option but it is probably the path of least resistance to, to getting that accomplished uh, and then I guess the last thing I have is uh, Travis brought forward a, uh, a letter that we got from the BLM yesterday and this is regarding uh, they're doing they're trying to amend the, the plan that they've set up for the renewable uh, projects that are on BLM lands. Uh, so what they're asking us for is, is if we want to be a cooperating agency on that. It would be similar to what we're doing with the uh, sage grouse and the big game corridors. Um, I don't see a downside to that. Um, we, we can go ahead and become a cooperating agency on that, participate in it. I am not aware of any lands in Montezuma County that have been designated as, as areas where they want renewable energy. And again, this is on federal land. Right. We're, we're aware of some on private lands, and there could be a, a federal nexus on that. For example, if you have a power transmission line that lies halfway across federal lands, connects to an outfit like that, that's on private lands well that's a federal nexus and so they're going to say oh this is a federal project and so you know they'll, they'll get to weigh in on everything so from that perspective you know possibly uh participating in that is not a bad thing um, i don't think it really obligates us to anything no funding uh, luckily so uh um anyway I'm, I'm willing to participate in that you know i, mean, I think it's a little bit of a time sink but um but again i'm willing to participate if the commissioner would like me to to do so and if that's the case i will uh, go ahead and and uh, register for it and make sure that we get okay. ourselves in line yeah might as go well ahead. james okay yeah okay we're good i'll, I'll uh, continue that to make we, that happen we kind of keep track of what's going on so yeah. more federal lands a little bit better James, if you would, to send me a copy, email me a copy of the comments you, we sent in for the Wolf reintroduction yes. deal, because I'm going to go to that meeting next Tuesday in Junction okay. for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. For, okay. So I'm going to go to that thing, and, you know, it, it's just like the Gunnison sun, Sage Grouse. They, we do all this stuff trying to keep them intact. What are we going to do? Put another predator on top of them? That's what they're doing. It sure is. And who will get blamed? The ranchers. Absolutely. Take the cows off. Yep. That's what will happen. Yep. But they're going to put another predator on top of them. Right. And those, and you know, Gerald, one Sorry, but those poor dumb birds not. They can't handle any more predators. Well, I totally when they agree. done their best is when everybody was controlling all the predators and stopped all that stuff back when we were getting rid of the coyotes and the magpies and everything else that get their eggs and yep. that's when they done their best yep. it's when everybody was in full control of these predators and look what's happening now 
Yeah, interesting observation on that, too. I'll just add on to that a little bit, Gerald, is, you know, when we had the highest numbers of sage grouse is when we were running the most numbers of cattle out oh, there on sure. that range. Most number of cows and sheep that was running on all these permits, we had the highest number, but people were controlling the predators. That's right. Sure were. Yeah. And that's what, what are we going to do? We're going to put another one on top of them. And it looks to me like the places that they've uh, suggested to release those wolves are right there in the sage grouse, right in the sure. epicenter of all that. It is. So. That's, that's, it's just crazy. Hard to believe they wouldn't be on the menu. but uh, Yeah. They're going to be on the menu, I'll guarantee you that. You bet. The wolves are not very picky about it. Oh, no, they're opportunistic like, you know, any other predator out there like that. You they're, know? Yeah. That's the thing people don't know about wolves is because they don't just hunt to eat they hunt for sport just like people do yep. well we've got a difficult situation in our hands um, I don't know what we can do but try to resist the best we can yeah, I know stay engaged so did you you got a copy of that Montrose County letter didn't you I did okay. yes did you get one Gerald I don't think I did I'll forward it to you okay actually send that to me too can I okay you, you said Moffat County Montrose Montrose okay. County, okay. I think I've got a copy. If you don't mind sending that, I might be mixing that up with Garfield County. Okay. And, and by the way, if I, you know, if it is not the same letter, I think I've got a letter that may have, may have been Garfield County. I'll, I'll forward that to you, too. So okay. we just try to exchange our, our information right, as best we can. I'll okay. get that done. Okay, gentlemen, well, I guess on that note, um, we'll, uh, that's, that's the end of my report. So unless we have any questions or other things uh, the commissioners would like me to uh, concentrate on or, or look into. That's it. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Jim. You bet. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Mr. Attorney. Biggest thing I have to report, um, last week I met with representatives from CDPHE and Ironwood about the, the chip pile and, and what's happening with that. Um, obviously, Ironwood's made efforts to continue moving chips for the past several months, but weather has curbed that a little bit. Um, there's been mud down in the Ironwood facility and mud at our landfill, and so there have been significant periods of time that um, they have not been able to haul. And so, um, as a result of that, um, CEPHE and Ironwood and, and the county are, are going to work together to look at what might be a reasonable extension of time for them to um, get rid of those chips. And, and so um, we did discuss that and, and, and discuss some potential dates. Nothing was, nothing was settled on at this point in time. Um, but, but the reality is for, you know, for the majority of December, January, and February, um, it was really difficult to transport chips down there. Um, another thing that came up during the, the conversation that I think is important for the BOCC, and it's all, it's all really hypothetical at this point, but Ironwood is um, proposing or at least throwing out the idea of incinerating some of those chips with what they call an air curtain incinerator. Um, my understanding is that that piece of equipment would cost Ironwood approximately at, in the neighborhood of $30,000. and um, and that equipment would be used to, to incinerate some of the chips. I, I think that their idea would be to incinerate some of the chips and then also um, continue to transport chips off-site. Um, I think that they feel like um, by doing some burning, um, they would be able to, to speed up the process and, and, and better, um, better take care of that situation there. Um, you know, during the meeting, I, I strongly conveyed to CDPHE and Ironwood um, this commission's concern about smoke. Um, you know, I know that um, you know, at different points in time over the course of this case, uh, incinerating that pile or incinerating portion of that pile has been brought up. And um, you know, the reality is, given where that mill is located and given the number of chips there, um, smoke's always going to be a, a concern. Um, CEPHE has been resistant in the past to issuing any kind of burn permit because of smoke and because of a policy from the Solid Waste Division of CDPHE. They generally do not um, favor burning as a, a mechanism of removing solid waste. Um, that's, that's sort of a general CDPHE policy. Um, that said, um, CDPHE is going to meet about this and, and discuss it, and, and I think it's something that we need to consider too. Um, what I asked is that CDPHE um, 
provide us some more information on these air curtain incinerators and how they work and, and what sort of smoke they, they give rise to because I just, I just simply don't have a lot of information as to how the things work and um, you know, certainly what was, what was pitched during the meeting was that this, this piece of equipment would um, be really useful and that it would, would greatly diminish the smoke that would come off any sort of burn that was done. Um, so I'll keep you guys updated um, as those discussions continue, and uh, and and certainly you know the county is going to have a, a say in this. We're a party to the to the stipulated injunction, just like CDPHE is, and and ultimately um, you know that may be something that we have to weigh in on at some point. But uh, wanted to put that out there. Um, it's something that's that's at least at least been been mentioned. Um, the only other significant thing from last week from a legal perspective. Um, last week I reported um, that the, the case involving the fractional interest owners from the Kinder Morgan um, tax assessments, that case had come down from the Supreme Court in our favor. Um, usually that means that the case is over. In this case, um, counsel for um, that CO2 corporation, um, they filed a uh, a motion with the court asking for an extension of time to file a petition for rehearing. Um, basically, it, it looks like they're going to try to ask the Supreme Court to um, for a rehearing on this case. What I can tell you is that's a that's a pretty long shot ask. <laughs> Usually, when the Supreme Court comes down, um, I mean they do it and they say what they say, and and that's the end of the road. I'm not sure what grounds they're going to try to ask for a rehearing on because I haven't seen the petition yet. Um, but, but that was filed last week and what they asked was for an extension out till April. Um, you know, obviously um, we're going to oppose that and, and then any sort of uh, petition for re rehearing uh, will oppose as well. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that the chances of a rehearing are very high, but, but it is out there and, and that is floating. So. That, that came down last week. For now, that's all I have to report. Thank you, Ian. Travis. Uh, busy, busy week, a lot of meetings. Um, submitted a letter of support on House Bill 23-1139 for uh, reclassification for the county and the elected officials to go from a 3D to a 3A. Um, Gina has submitted her retirement letter, so we're going to start the process on trying to find a candidate to fill her position, and hopefully we can get whoever that individual is to work with Gina for a month to kind of learn some of the ropes, so um, it's going to be quite the process there. Uh, completed um, county by county review that was sent out to the commissioners. Uh, Lastly, uh, but not least, went to Durango, was able to meet with Senator Simpson, myself, uh, Bonnie, and Commissioner Candelaria. Obviously, we're mandated to have a noxious weed department, but we don't get any funding. So, met with Senator Simpson, and obviously the phreatophytes take up a lot of water, and so hopefully we can work something out to where there's a, a bill submitted where they have to submit some of it. In addition to that, we're hoping to get Bonnie on the summer CCI agenda and she can go over and make a presentation and, and get other counties on board. So, busy, busy week. Thank you. Commissioner Copenhaver, do you have anything? Uh, last Wednesday, I had a meeting for AAA. We talked about the budget of AAA and where they're going to possibly be with this the same deal as the SNAP funds. They've All of them are getting cut back to the pre-COVID levels that they were at before. So all of that, we should be about the same as we had this last year, I imagine. But then on Thursday, I had a, a meeting with Southwest Water District for legislative issues that are coming down through the legislature. Any of them that have to do with water, we, we have a Zoom meeting on that every two weeks. So uh, we had that on Thursday. Uh, other than that, just some phone calls. Um, they did have 
one of these incinerators in Mancus at the at the old plant before it caught fire and burned. I don't know whatever happened to that incinerator, but they were using one there in Mancus for a while. One of these, um, we actually went over there and looked at it because they came to us about putting it in over there, and they actually put one in there. And I don't know whatever happened to it after that caught fire and they rebuilt everything. I don't know what happened to that one that was there, but they had one that they were actually incinerating some stuff there. And uh, the temperature is so hot that it actually does actually incinerate things. You don't see the smoke coming off of it like you do on the other piles of stuff that, because it's burning it so hot and so fast, you don't see that. And it did work. I mean, yeah. it, it 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 did work to some, you know. So I mean, it's it's a possibility that they could do that without a bunch of smoke. Okay. I mean, because that one did do that, and they would be basically well, they were burning aspen instead of pine. But I wouldn't think it would be that terrible much difference as far as that goes. But that that one did. It, it's burning so hot that it just. It burns it up completely. It doesn't. It doesn't smoke like that. that so, and that's certainly the way they presented it. Um, yeah. That it would be a, you know, that it would be near smokeless or greatly reduced smoke. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it greatly. Re I wouldn't say it was totally smokeless, but it, it did. It did burn it so hot that you didn't see much coming off of it. But man, it was hot. <laughs> I mean, it was hot. Anything else? That's yeah. About I did have a housing solutions meeting, and uh, like AAA, we did a lot of budget work with them. And uh, then on Monday, we had our workshop and went over a lot of what we discussed here today. And then I stopped by the extension office to meet with the folks over there that, that are on the advisory board for the extension. And I came out of that meeting feeling like they have some promise. They're gonna do some stuff and hopefully get things lined out with extension. Extension's really expanding. And then yesterday we went over also and participated in their open house. And a few folks came in. It was pretty pretty amazing. So, and other than that, a few phone calls and face-to-face and -face meetings. That's about the size of it. else? No, I have nothing else. I move we adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye.